Welcome to Three, a show about Federer, Nadal, and Djokovic, and part of the Tennis Channel Podcast Network. I'm Gil Gross with Joel Drucker and Amy Lundy, and it is officially the business end. The final eight as Djokovic and Federer come through the final Manic Monday in uh, in Wimbledon history. Both uh, Djokovic gets a straight set victory over Christian Garin, 6-2, 6-4, 6-2. And Federer also in straight sets, 7-5, 6-4, 6-2 over Lorenzo Sinego. Well, let's start with uh, Novak's match. And uh, we were spot, we were almost spot on, but I lost, uh, I lost my bet. Remember I predicted there would be a bagel or a breadstick and I, I got a pair of six twos, but I didn't get the bagel or the breadstick still pretty good by Novak, Joel. Pretty dominant. I mean, Novak just very comfortable, um, kind of a case of someone who's good meeting someone who's great. And again, this gets to the whole skills dilemma and someone who's a excellent player, but now you're coming up against a Titan and Novak looks is so focused and, and so clean and just very brisk day for him. Mm -hmm. I thought Garin looked fairly demoralized. Novak gets the highlight of the day, in my opinion. I think it was second set three all, and Novak chases down a drop shot and makes just an incredible redrop. I don't know if you guys remember that one. Mm -hmm fantastic and you know Gareen like dove for the ball and and just the look on his face was kind of like I'm not even coming close today so um you know all systems go for Novak everything looking good and um I watched a couple of interviews after the match and it was really interesting to hear Novak uh respond to a question about how his game has changed over the last 10 years, because it's been 10 years since he won his first Wimbledon. And he made the comment that he tries to come into the net a little more. Hmm. So I, I was really um, surprised to hear that and, and actually delighted. Are you, oh, I thought you were going to, I thought it was going to send you on a hunt. It just it said, like he, he was sending out a signal for you to go hunt down, to research it, to determine it. So to, to <laughs> how, many, how many points has Novak played? At Wimbledon over the last ten years, and as he and and um and even if it's only even if it was only more uh, five points a match, that's just as well because maybe the the notion of forward intent is really helpful, and so his his concept of taking away time and coming up to it more, and he he probably is, but it's uh that's that's interesting, that's that's neat, it's kind of amazing to think, you know, he's already number three in the world before he won Wimbledon for the first time, and that and then he wins it in eleven, and here he is evolving his game. And even that point you mentioned, Amy, made me think about what a, what a treat it is, again, even in a routine match, to watch these virtuosos just do their thing and how neat, I mean, in a way, Wimbledon, which we haven't had for two years, this special Monday into the second week of the tournament, that's, that's pretty special. Well, it's kind of funny. So I'm looking at net points one for this match now. And, uh, Garin was at the net 27 times and Novak was at the net 29 times. And you no, know, Garin, clay quarter, baseliner. Um, so, you know, that number doesn't stick out. Okay, Novak was only there t twice more than Garin, but Novak won 79% of his net points. Garin won 41% of his net wow. points. 41%. He I won think, 41. 41%. That is like a, that, that, I mean, you should. You should by just getting there <laughs> 55, just by being there. And then if you're somewhat proficient, it's usually, well, it's usually 60 plus and then 79 is sparkling. I mean, that's the type of stuff that helps Novak see I'm playing well. And these are the, this is a play I need to run if I win this tournament and beat these other guys too. Good stuff. Yeah. Uh, well, I think, I think Novak's in the camp and we've, we've spoken about this before. He's kind of like Nadal where he hits great approach shots and he's not going to come to net unless he hits a great approach shot. Right. Yeah. It's a little, I mean, Roger, it's pretty good approach shots, but I think Roger's a little yeah. more versatile volleyer, a little more versatile volleyer in kind of the old school way. Whereas guys like uh, Nadal and, and Djokovic, they're coming in with house money. I can still like, I'm still not used to watching Djokovic. I'm getting used to it. I must admit, but I'm not used to watching him play matches where he is the way better server. And, and this was another one of those matches. And it just, every time that happens, it feels so unfair because you have the greatest grass court baseliner 
of, of all time, likely. And his serve is way better than his opponent. Yeah, so, his serve has improved, you know, over, over the last 10 years um, that, that they were looking at that time frame since he won his first Wimbledon. Djokovic's serve has gotten even better. And he, you know, he was going through that phase for a while where he was hitting that really hard and fast second serve that it wasn't quite as fast as his first serve, but it was not as slow as the typical second serve. And I looked at his serve speeds lately for this tournament and they're not quite that fast. So he's back down to more like a typical second serve, but then again, he hasn't really needed to do anything special. Well, also, and also grass is kind of like a, uh, a tax credit on your serve. Everybody's mm -hmm. serve is better on grass. It aids it even in the contemporary grass. So he just, uh, and I think this is also, we can talk about the, the Goran effect. I mean, I don't like to think of coaching as autobiography, but clearly when you have someone who served as magnificently as Goran Ivanisevic, there's some concepts in there. Might even be as simple as how they go about practicing it and some of the things they do to build, to sharpen the technique and see the sequences and all of that. I heard Brad Gilbert make a, an interesting point just on serve speed today, where he said Wimbledon is, is the coolest major and that that's going to take a little bit off your serve where, where the balls are a little bit less compressed in the cooler weather. So, so the, the court surface helps your serve, but in terms of what you're getting on the radar gun, that might be the difference between, you know, one and two mi one or two miles per hour. I don't know. You'd need a, we, we'd need a physicist, but I thought that was an interesting idea. Yeah. And I saw a graphic today from data driven sports analytics who does some, um, data for several of the top players and he had looked at um novak's first and second serve speeds for the first two slams of the year versus wimbledon and novak was down on first and second serve about two mphs per hmm. not that it's a big deal like I mean, it's just, and, and, you know, the bottom line is, are you winning and are you effective with your serve? And obviously he has been. Yeah. At, at the tune of 92% first serves won against Christian Garin. So uh, that brings up the quarterfinal for Novak and, and we'll get to Feder after this. Um, well, we didn't do any draw cat. This is why, this is why we didn't break down Djokovic Rublev in our draw show. Uh, I, I thought Rublev would make it to the, this quarterfinal, but he loses in five sets today to uh, Hungarian Marton Fucevic, who is just always dangerous in best of five. He's been in the round of 16 at all four majors and, and now in the quarterfinal, um, someone who has a history um, with Djokovic. But uh, I'll let either of you jump in. I mean, on the, on the Rublev upset, you know, that's the match he comes off of. It's pretty impressive, and he took out Sinner in the first round as well. Martin Fucevic, uh, he beat Sinner. Uh, Yuri Vesely, Schwartzman, and Rublev uh, in consecutive rounds. Mm -hmm. that's, that's entering into kind of – he might be nearing the new, the new uh, Gilgros cult favorite, work hard, grind it out kind of guy. I don't know. He's very um, – that's impressive. And I'm beginning – maybe I have a little bit of a concern about the Rublev future. Like, is he going to be kind of a parked – you know, eight through 20 guy and not quite be a seven through four guy. I don't know yet, but, but still, uh, that was a five setter and he won the, uh, Fucevic won the last two sets, zero and three. That's some pretty good tennis. I mean, he's logged a lot of miles. First Hungarian, uh, man in the quarters, 1948. <laughs> Jeez, Louise, that's, uh, putting in some hard work. So this is kind of a little bit of his, uh, of his summer. Remember when Vukovic played Rublev earlier in the year, like four straight times right. and lost four straight times? It was like that. Do you remember that place same time next week? Yeah, it was in a bunch of ATP events. One of them was Miami. I clearly remember that one. Another one was an indoor hard court. And I mean, now this was like, you know, what would you rather have? Those four losses or this win and probably Martin would take this win everybody would so, everybody yes. would. Right. A little bit yes. like but you know looking ahead to Djokovic um 
Djokovic was also in, uh, interviewed about Fukovic, and he said that a I, I, little bit of a surprise, but you know, English is not Novak's first language, but he said that Martin has no big weapons, but a good all around game. So I thought that was an interesting comment. Truth. Truth. Yeah. yeah. Truth. Well, it's also from the vantage point. It's the whole, it's the whole draw. I mean, I think, uh, I think that I think Schwarzman might have felt differently because you know, it's like it's it's who he's playing against. But to Novak, it's like, oh yeah, this guy, I know him. I, I, mean, I would slightly. Here's where I would say: is is fitness a weapon, Joel? If fitness, yes, is, fitness a weapon, is a weapon, then then he has Novak, a weapon. On the other hand, on the other hand, <laughs> it is a weapon. But compared to Novak, I mean, Novak, <laughs> might be, who's in the in the Roy Emerson zero zero one percent of fitness? Yeah, I mean, but fitness is a weapon for sure. But but now you're up again. It's like, okay, let's match our fitness. Well, I think that is the question coming into this matchup. Um, and it is a three, uh, no, a 2 0 head to head for Djokovic. But their meeting at, at the 2018 US Open was, was pretty memorable. It was the first round, and Fucevic won the first set 3 6 and then had real chances in the third set uh, to win that third set and go up two sets to one ended up losing at 6-4 and then had nothing left by the fourth set and lost 6-love. And it was a really steamy hot day and people were were starting to say, here we go again with Djokovic in the heat, but but he came through it. But f- for, for a couple sets there, Fucevic really uh, showed off his ability to be tough and do a lot of running and do a, do a lot of defending. Um, so, I mean, I think that's where the only way where, where Novak could get uncomfortable is if he expects to wear this guy down because, uh, you know, Fucevic will run and defend likely for five sets. It's a couple of years later. I think he's even more fit here in 2021 than he was in 18. But I think fitness is less of a factor. This is where the grass is a different right. kind of deal. Even this kind of grass, because the way this isn't going to be like we're playing, we're playing on clay or it's, or we're in Hamburg, we're kind of have to, work our way when we're having to work our way through it this is about proficiency and skills that's what makes Wimbledon so exciting I mean that's gonna that has the the fetter implication that this isn't about this isn't a dance marathon this is a showcase of skills and Novak has significantly better skills so I think that's that's not going to help the underdog what, I what also will... think time on court, total time on court um, I, I haven't added it up but I imagine that Novak has spent significantly less time on court oh you got to think that just intuitively oh, yeah. i mean he, novak hasn't yeah. played a five setter and then a four setter and then a, a four setter in the first round and you know this is all new world being in the going to the quarters of a slam and and wimbledon and all these things and again novak's got this thing down to a science even even with the bubble he probably he probably did a a prep on what it means what you should eat in the bubble you know and certain things and he's got his pit crew working on it martin what he hasn't <laughs> hasn't been this far before. What's it mean? I'm in the quarters of a major and that's a, it's a big deal. Yeah. And he, he is someone who my, in my opinion, his biggest weakness is, is he'll get nervous. Uh, I, and I've, I've watched him a lot. And I think when he's at his best, he's just a sensational player who, who should be seated along with Struff. And that's, that's uh, my new committee that I started today, which is the make Struff and Fucevic seated committee uh but but he will get nervous and we've seen we've seen garin you know garin looked a little bit deer in headlights in in the first set and uh we've seen it with the with a couple of guys now at this tournament well the limited the, the, this the way in every era there's a conventional a style that's the prevailing way of playing and novak is kind of the master of the of the prevailing style just like let's say um you know, John Newcomb was a sort of volleyer kind of player and had that was the master of that in his time. And so the guys who play that way, when they come up against these other guys, that they're gonna they're gonna beat a lot of the people who they should beat. They're gonna win their tough matches. You know, Rublev can win a five set of the next time. But then you get against the big guys. What do you have? How much broader is your line of attack for beating them? I mean, what becomes? I mean, like Karin, what what was his? How does he think he's going to win? Compete in that match? He's gonna compete. He's gonna try. But what's he got that's really going to question Novak? And this gets to the skills development thing, maybe from an early age, but also when you're on the tour. And it's it's hard. I mean, it's it's hard. I mean, pros have told me they 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 got a game that's a game that's gotten them pretty far. 
So it's not going to yeah. suddenly, you know, you, you're not going to expect to see this guy become like, you know, Boris Becker at the net. He does some stuff though. You know, I mean, I, yeah, I, I like the, agility. the, the backhand I mean, slice was key against Rublev. And I'll be interested to see if he does that against Novak. Federer does that against Novak on grass. Um, and, uh, you know, we saw Dan Evans do it on clay, right? I mean, it's, it's just a shot. It's not going to win a match for you. Uh, but, but it is interesting. And what, what Rublev didn't have um, was the ability to just slice back, right? Because a, a great, if someone hits a great cross court slice against me, I'm just going to slice cross court back. And Rublev just doesn't have that. And Novak does, right? Novak's got a lot of things. Yeah, he's got yeah. A, lot of, a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um, let's get, or I think, uh, I believe we're ready to get to Federer now. Um, a, a three set victory over Sinego. We got better as the match went on. It was a, a really shaky first set. Um, just n not shaky as in, no, I guess it was a little bit scratchy and it was also tight and, and close. Uh, Amy, what are your uh, takeaways from the fed match? That, there were so many break opportunities for Roger once again, and and this is a this is a lifelong, career long deal for him. And you know we can talk about it and hash it out, and maybe he he creates more break opportunities, even though he converts fewer, and and all this other stuff. Um, that article's reams have been written on that before. Um, he actually i thought did well getting into those really long service games of sonigo in the first set because i don't care who you are if you serve that much and you're doing 11 12 minute games you're going to tire out and it's it's just the law of nature and physics um your serve may not be what it was and 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 you're going to tire out mentally too so just getting into those service games was a huge key and then he pulled that first set out and he looked great from from there yeah the first set he uh he served for it and was broken at love so that's that was a little strange but and then there was a delay while they put up the roof but it was uh it's pretty good for him and then he got in a good rolling way i think the thing about the break points if you're three of 15 on break points you're not going to break 15 times so it's a it's not the statistic there's a way there's a way to look at the statistic, I think, as when you had a break point, how soon in the set did you did you capitalize on it rather than the futility aspect? Because if you if you capture that break early and you hold as well as Federer holds, that's pretty good. But it's just the, the futility aspect of like the efficiency. The efficiency well, of it. Well capturing it early example, but if you if Federer if Federer breaks serve at one all on his first break point and then keeps holding, and through the rest of the set, he's getting break points, but he's not winning them. That's that's less frustrating because he got the break anyway. But if he's not getting the break and suddenly now it's five all and he's and he's let eight of them go by, then it's yeah. interesting. You're right. It's the efficiency. It's the capturing it soon enough to put yourself in the driver's seat. But today, today to me was the most emphatic example of Fed yeah. Oh, I see. Now I see why you left Paris. This is where you needed you wanted to be, and it became and then it became the covered court and it's Wimbledon. It felt like okay. This, this is why I this is why I left Paris. What Roger was saying with his tennis, and he was playing pretty pretty fluidly through those last two sets of that match against a, a tr tricky shot making slashing kind of opponent. I thought he did a lot of good things. Uh, the return was uh, I think he was getting first serve returns in play, especially after the first set, and then just you know getting the misses behind it that that Sinego was sometimes just not really shorthanded. And uh, he was attacking the Sinego backhand very regularly. And he was getting to, to net more than any other match thus far in the tournament, which just tells me that when, when he sees a short ball, that green light uh, goes off in his head and, and, and he's taking it as an approach shot. And he's, he has his convictions about him. And I think that's the, the best version of Roger Feder. I don't think that there's that much that, that you can take from, from that match that that was negative yeah and remember i know i sound like a broken record but every round for roger i talk about his serve and is he getting enough easy points free points on his serve like he always has done at wimbledon and um 
I perceived very early on that he wasn't like early in this tournament mm -hmm. that he's not there yet that where are the 90 second service holds and all that well I saw a stat today this is really good this is also from data driven sports analytics um, in round one unreturned serves of Roger Federer 30 percent round two 35 percent round three 39 percent he hasn't, Shane hasn't updated yet for this match against Sonigo, but I bet you anything it's above 39%. That's great. And it's going to be interesting to see in the next round, no matter who he plays, he's going to play a pretty good returner. So that's going to be, inter that's going to be an interesting thing to see. I mean, I think his next round is going to play against probably his, his best quality returner. So we'll, that's, that's, yeah, right. I, that is a key metric for Roger because it's like all these things with Roger, Break points, coming to net, all these things. How do you make the point shorter? How do you make the point shorter? How do you make the point shorter? And how do you do that around the whole corner of things? Because there are going to be some longer taxing rallies. So how around the corner, you know, it's kind of like, what was the, what was your concept the other day, Amy? The field, the magnetic, the yeah. force field. Roger, mm -hmm. the, the force field. Yeah. So how do you, how do you, how do you keep that reinforced? How do you keep all those bolts reinforced? Mm -hmm. So am I holding, am I getting, Am I getting traction with serve? I, because with Roger, well, it's interesting how that works. It shows you how, how multifaceted his game is too. And again, to, to get at the whole um, skill building thing, it's a really interesting thing for players like Roger and Novak and Nadal, how these guys aren't monolithically great. They're great in little incremental parts. It's like a, a, a team sport where you're adding a wide receiver, making the linemen better, making all mm -hmm. these little parts and pieces better. And you see how they, it'd be interesting to ask Roger the same question um, that Novak was asked. Well, how are you better than you were 10 years ago? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we saw things with the back and stuff. That'd be interesting. Pretty soon he'll be using it, the weed racket. <laughs> the big racket. <laughs> <laughs> it'll be uh, really interesting to see uh, the the unreturned percentage because it, it, it felt like, it felt like Federer was getting free points, but he had one ace the entire match. So it, that'll make it even more fascinating to see, did he make up for it with the, with the number of service winners that he hit? Um, yeah, and, you know, it's uh, unreturned serve percentages. I guess I'll go on the soapbox. That should be on every stat sheet mm -hmm. is, is yeah. right. Every stat sheet should have that. And, and it doesn't. Um, like the, the official stats don't have it, but on the world feed broadcast, they do have it. And uh, I didn't, I didn't catch it, but I just want to throw separate that out. From aces, separate from aces. Is that your desire? Like no, a, no. With, with aces. aces, with aces. It's just we how know, many. But I think it'd be great. I think it'd be great. For example, I, they each have, you know, there's a, there's a psychic gain from each. That's a little different. I mean, ace is kind of like, Whoa, that was pretty neat where, I mean, not that Federer can't hit plenty, but a, an unreturn is like, oh, that's good. It's like a missed passing shot. I'd rather, a, a getting guy to miss a passing shot is better than a volley winner. Next, that's that's the next step. I don't disagree with you, but let's let's make baby steps because right now they won't even tell me how many returns go in, in play. Well, the, go, uh, Gil, just to let you know, those stats are being kept. Um, I, oh, oh, I'm, I'm, in I, fact, I'm, I'm, I'm aware. I, I meant to print out a match report um, that I had from 2019. It's an 11 page report from IBM. Every single match that's played at Wimbledon gets an 11 page report filled with stats like that. And, and unreturned serves, you could very easily figure that out probably yeah. by, by um, adding, if they don't just out right keep that stat anyway um the public gets to see about i don't know maybe 10 15 percent of the stats that are actually kept yeah I, i'm just saying like that is a very basic stat that should be out there for everyone like it's as important as anything well, more also, important also, than aces it's a better stat than aces oh it's definitely a better stat than aces and it also um it also then can kind of parse what goes on in the rallies because now we're now the zero to four is, you know, you can put that aside and then look at rallies as the street from just, you know, you see what I mean? So they can look at rally length truly beside as like, if the rally doesn't start, if the rally ends with a serve and a mystery turn, what is that? What do we call that? Is that a, is that a one shot rally? Is that a two shot rally? That is I mean, a one. Really? That is <laughs> a, a one. one shot yeah. Rally. 
I'm yeah. going to serve and the points ended. Yeah. That's so, one. so there's or, interesting or ways. I had a serve and yeah, exactly. And, and the, the ball was off somebody's racket. That is, that is uh, a one. So the ball off the racket is as unreturnable as a hit as a long, of course. Yeah, that's right. But there's, that's a real, that stuff could be really interesting because again, I think mystery turns are more um, psychically rewarding than, yeah. um, than just this. It's like a mystery. Turn. Oh, I maybe, maybe, maybe depending even though on, uh, on the miss, right. If, if, uh, if they smoke it and it lands at your foot, yeah. but, but, but an inch past the baseline, that's one thing, yeah. but, yeah. but, you know, I, I actually think this is a super relevant conversation to Federer's next opponent. And we don't actually know. Uh, who that opponent is, but especially Medvedev in particular, is nearly impossible to ace. Djokovic hit 103 aces uh, over the course of the 2021 Australian Open, and I think he hit like two or three against Medvedev. You, you can't ace him. He's he's standing, he's standing 12 feet back. He's six foot six. You're not going to ace him, but you can you can get forward. You can come forward on him. And uh, Hercotch, similarly very long. Um, and, and, and is another good, good returner in his own respect. So I guess the interesting thing right now, and we'll talk about the scheduling, but for either opponent that Federer faces, I think we're looking at a kind of a similar deal. Um, uh, someone who is a pace absorber, a redirector, a very flat backhand, and someone who's less comfortable creating than they are reacting. So who of these guys, it's interesting, the, the legacy from the three, that in some ways these guys have the, the, one, the two-hander and the one-hander thing, but in certain ways, that thing is a little more borrowing pages from some of the Federer book than the Djokovic book, because Federer, at times, his career has been not a redirect. You know, Federer has been a pace absorber with his returns. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. These guys, they don't quite return in the Novak way with a two-hander or, or, or Nishikori or Rublev. They're kind of crafty, right? They're kind of you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a certain kind of disruption. So it's an interesting style. It's a fascinating match to see how they each do against Federer. And they each played him. Federer's 3-0 uh, versus Medvedev, 1-0 versus Hurchkov. But, he, he play, but they played him, played him way back in 2019. So it's a long time ago for both those guys' careers. So yeah, interesting I, matchup. I, Medvedev is going to be a tough, uh, would be a tough matchup for Federer. Um, I mean... <sighs> If I were Roger, I would go to that Australian Open final against Djokovic where Djokovic smoked him, and I would just put that thing on repeat. Or I would have his coaches look at it and say, where are we getting the errors from this guy? You know, is it the forehand? It probably is the forehand. Um, you know, and, and just start cooking up patterns to play against him um and just put that thing on repeat because you're right gil getting the free points off of the serve is going to be tricky certainly djokovic provided a model on beating uh beating medvedev on a on a fast court but i even think you know dare i say federer can can look to what marin cilic did to medvedev going up two sets to love and to me, the big question coming into this match, if if it if they play, is can someone successfully return against Roger Federer on grass standing that far back? You know, is he going to get exposed via the serve and volley? Is Federer gonna hit a serve plus one approach shot, you know, every single time? Because it's just really difficult to make up that ground. And I, I just think Federer is gonna go to the net. Um, I think he's going to live there on his surface games with Medvedev so far back. And then also the way he takes away depth with a drop shot or a so short slice. Yeah, I agree. I think the way, I think there's, there's value to be gained from watching how Novak beat Medvedev, but Roger think, hey, wait, I'm Roger Federer. I build points a little differently than Novak with my forehand. And I mean, this gets to our ongoing forehand discussion or our serve discussion uh, about how these guys use their shots. But certainly there's some things Novak did, but there's a different, you know, Rogers, the dynamic quality of his forehand, the way he, the way he waits, you know, that he holds the ball as it were, and can then hit behind people harshly and angled. But I think, I think Federer's um, would look at that as sort of like a little bit of a, of a mathematical question. Like, Hmm, what do we do here? Chat with his team a little bit and kind of 
do the 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 Roger thing, but it's it'd be tricky. I, I really I really want to see him play Medvedev. That really intrigues me because the, when they last played, it was a whole different stage of Medvedev's career, and uh, and now it's a newer Medvedev who's used to these stages, and uh, that should be really fascinating. I agree. Uh, now uh, Hercotch is. Uh... To me, again, uh, I think just a slightly less dangerous version, or not even slightly, it's almost disrespectful of the world number two, um, a, a less dangerous version of Daniil Medvedev, a similar kind of flat counter-striking style. So regardless, Roger um, will will be asked to do things. So it, it should be interesting. But we have to talk about the scheduling because you know there's always going to be already a, a notion that Roger Federer gets uh, preferential treatment at a tournament like Wimbledon. And, you know, people had an eyebrow raised at the fact that Medvedev and Hercotch, who were in the middle of the fourth set, were not scheduled on center court after the, uh, the, the Federer match because it was raining. And the original match was on court three, no roof. So the thought process was, why don't you just put them on center? You, they would have gotten it done in all likelihood before the 11 p.m. curfew. If they just put them on center, closed the roof under the lights, and they could finish the, the match. That way, each, that way they get a day of rest on Tuesday like everyone else. Do we have any, any thoughts on, on that decision? Well, matches have been relocated. There, there have been times in terms to say, thou shalt not, fit, thou shalt not move courts. Wimbledon has done this before, and so I was a little surprised. So it, it was more, it was relocating more than scheduling. The original schedule had them on, on a certain court, and the center court schedule was, was that. So the fact that there was time in the day and the tournament didn't move them there. Um, Medvedev is up two sets to one, and it's 4-3 in the fourth. So in theory, it could be a, a quick day. But on the other hand, the whole mental, physical process of gearing up to compete for a match, to finish it, is a different thing. And then... If it goes longer, and, and et cetera, that's that's raises some real some real questions about why that was done, and they'll be asked about that, and the, whoever wins that match will be asked about that, and they'll probably say something kind of high road and that they won, but still, still, it's starting at uh, that match is starting at one thirty on a Tuesday, so regardless, if if it ends quickly, and it can end by two fifteen, that means that person is what resting by five, back at the hotel. So it's and a remember, it's they're very far away this year. They're not That's as right. close as usual because of the bubble. They're not in the they're not in the village, right? The village right. is a lot right. closer. Right. They're in a London. So there's a whole other process around that. So it's basically putting in a whole day of work. Because so I don't know. What do you think about that, Amy? I have no idea why they didn't finish that match on center court after the Federer match. It, it would have been the perfect time to do it um there was you know the crowd would have loved it it just made all the sense in the world i i have no idea and i'm big on fairness and you know really big on fairness i yeah i, I get it it has to be balanced with you know what people want to see and the tickets that you sell and all that but novak was put on court one once during this tournament and i think roger should be but that's a different question that's the I know. Question. I know it's a different question. Right. I know and, it's a different and by question. the way, Medvedev has not been on center. He's the number two seed on the men's side, and he'll finally play on center now for, for this for this restart. So, yeah, I mean, every time you put that. every time you put Roger on center, that's somebody else's opportunity not to play on center, and it becomes Roger's home court, and that's where he's comfortable, and he, you know. He uh, knows that court very well. And if he goes through the entire tournament and doesn't have to play on another court, you have to ask yourself, how fair is that? I don't know. Well, well that's going to happen now because he's in the quarters. This, yeah. this can get to our future labor PTPA kind of questions too about what, what makes the sport run. I mean, because in a way, the players know that the success of the three has lined their pockets because they're the – they're the marquee players. So the challenge, I think, what I'm curious to see as we look at the PTPA and the, the need to create more income equality is then how do other players help continue to move the needle so the whole sport becomes successful? Because we all know those guys are all great. All these players at the top 200 
are tremendous players and, and all capable of putting on playing great tennis on center court. So, so how does that affect the ways and the mix, the mix of the current marketplace, the desired marketplace? Um, it's, it's a fascinating kind of topic, but uh, yeah, Roger Federer, I mean, it, it's just like uh, we were talking about this before Jimmy Connors, I think in 14 years at the U S open, never played outside of Louis Armstrong court. And granted the secondary court there was not the grandstand wasn't as robust as these other courts what didn't have as many seats so so i get that but uh it's interesting to it's interesting to think about well i i feel like we should acknowledge the possibility that the players were asked if they would like to finish on center and they and and someone and it might have been one of them it might have been both of them or or their teams and they said no let's let's get to bed it's late uh, I just think we should acknowledge that as it's a possibility. I, I, I don't think I don't think I don't think they ask them if they want to finish on set. I don't think they did that. I mean, I've been around Wimbledon. Okay. I, I don't. Think they, I don't think they asked them. And the players said, "No, nah, I want to go to sleep." I mean, you're a player, Gil. You know, it's like I think the players, if they were given the choice, and also this thing with giving players choices. This reminds me a few years ago of the of the Nadal Djokovic semi that lasted two days at Wimbledon, that they started indoors, and the next day the tournament gave the, put it to the players, which I thought was a little strange about the roof, about playing it under the roof or not. And Novak said, yeah, I want to play it under the roof. And it was a sunny day. I want to, I want to finish it as we started. So I think this stuff, I think there's some interesting little try points going on here between marquee players, um, significant, you know, mark, the rest of the players, tournaments. I mean, it's, it's going to be some interesting talks around that in tennis and don't forget about men and women there's there's right. always that as well absolutely, absolutely. that's right because what if there was some other de- marquee dean worthy woman i mean who have who would want it well and where do they get assigned that's a great point yep well i mean uh, you know uh, hopefully we get more answers on this and some some reporting is done on what actually went down i'm assuming the organizers will have to make a Make so, give some kind of explanation, or am I totally wrong, Joel? They don't have to. No, they're gonna. They do. No. They, they do the explanation. They put out some more They put out the next day's schedule. They don't What's have to. The... <laughs> that's that's that's, okay. that's their statement. I mean, there's a statement, and and that was that. I mean, and also okay. Wimbledon though, has a way, like Wimbledon has this way. They kind of move on and make their decisions, and that was it. It's probably smart, right? If you make a statement now, everyone might be up in your grill for your your logic. I don't know, and, and I don't know sound, all these right? things, you know. And some of the stuff, it's like who knows. So they come out tomorrow. Uh, Medvedev wins in in twenty minutes, and uh, there you have it. Yeah. Well, uh, all right. Federer's opponent to be decided tomorrow. First up, center court, one thirty. Djokovic will take on the fitness monster. Martin Fucevic and uh, we are looking forward to that and of course we'll have a pod for you uh, the the night of or the afternoon after uh, that'll do it for this episode of three remember we're available on all podcast platforms and if you're watching on YouTube make sure to like the video subscribe and leave a comment we will see you next time on the next episode of three